forward. How about that? Did it just switch the slide? It's doing a whole bunch of weird things with my multi screens, guys. Sorry. Yep, yep, it did. We're on your next slide. We are. Fantastic. All right. So, community schools. So, in the Des Moines Public School District, we are part of the Coalition for Community Schools, which is an organization that's based out of um, DC. It's part of the IEL, the um, Institute for Educational Leadership. So, it's like a branch under um, the Institute for Educational Leadership. So uh, the coalition really is a support partner, not that different from Iowa After School for 21st Century, but the coalition really has provided some technical support um, to us as we have scaled up this model uh, for the district. So community schools essentially, and this is kind of the mission statement that we have put together for Des Moines Public Schools, that we exist to build meaningful partnerships between family schools and the community leading to improved student learning, thriving families and vibrant neighborhoods. So what we really believe in community schools is that the work does not happen just within the four walls of the school. That we know that our kids live in a community and we do everything we can to build that hub within the school. So all those support services live within that school. So, um, I'm going to kind of talk through each pillar and then some of the history as to why we have scaled up community schools in the Des Moines Public School District. And then you guys too, stop me if you have questions along the way, and I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm going to get out of sharing mode because I think that's what's making it funky. Hold on. Do you see it now still? Yeah, okay. So our recent scale up, um, we have done some community problem solving within our community to really listen to what our community is asking for. Um, we did our anti-racist town halls in 2020 in response to um, all of the uh, community um, conversations that were happening in response to George Floyd's murder. Um, and then we developed a strategic plan as a district. So that's what you're gonna see right here on this slide. And community schools really is doing work around engagement and community building safety and health and well-being for the Des Moines Public School District. So as a result of this work, we did um, listening to our community, doing community listening sessions. Um, we added 28 new community school coordinators in January of 2022. So we now have 51 um, full-time community school coordinators, K through 12, and every building in our district has a community school coordinator representative. So the first pillar I'm gonna talk about is integrated student supports. And this is really around how we are supporting students in the building. Um, we believe that through a tiered system of support that we can ensure that each child is healthy, safe, supported, engaged, and challenged. So here's how we do that through our community school model. We have a system where you can put in student support tickets. Anybody can, parents, teachers, community members, and then our community school coordinators are responding to those support tickets in a timely way, and then working within their building uh, tiered system to make sure our students are getting timely support services, whether that's access to a food pantry, it could be that um, you know loss of employment at home has really ca caused a hardship. So what are our community school coordinators doing to make sure that our families have access to those support services in a timely way? We're regularly bringing in community partners, um, whether that's, like I said, through food insecurity, that could be through, um, school-based therapy services that could be um, Iowa legal aid to support anyone who is looking at eviction. Um, we are doing that on a regular basis based on the needs that we are hearing from the community. And then we're also coordinating our universal tier supports. So those would be our food pantries that are based in our schools, our um, clothing closets, and any um, programs that we're bringing in to support the adults in our system. So those would be 
the integrated support. And that's the first pillar that we focus on in community schools. I'm gonna pause right there and see if you guys have any questions around integrated student supports. Okay, so you guys should all be experts in this one. So this is expanded time and opportunities. So this is the pillar that community school coordinators are really looking at. How are we engaging and enriching the school day for our students? Whether that's through summer programming, um, after school programming, bringing in partners in the summer and during the school year, um, increasing um, what is it that people want after school? Not just assuming, but asking, and then being really intentional about what we're bringing in and our expectation now that we're in all DMPS buildings is that doesn't just happen where we have 21st century funding, that happens in every building. Um, and we know the power of after school, and that is a very important pillar of community schools as well. The third pillar for community schools we focus on is family and community engagement. Uh, we believe that families, neighborhoods, and communities are assets and looking at how we mobilize those assets to bring them into the building. Um, we do that through regular two-way communication. In our district, we use an application called School Connects. It's now called Snap Connects. What is fantastic about this application is it um, has a translation ability. So everyone, regardless of language, can communicate with teachers, with school nurses, with our after-school staff, and it um, really opens doors to make sure that Every uh, student does have access to um, be able to communicate with support staff in the school building. We're also responsible for coordinating programs um, that support the transition. We're a really big district. Um, so incoming kindergartners, fifth graders transitioning to sixth grade, and then our eighth graders transitioning to ninth grade. We really set ourselves up in our community school work and our feeder patterns. So we're working together as a team to really build that community. So we're thinking about kids when they enter in in kindergarten, how are we thinking about them as Roosevelt Rough Riders, our Lincoln Rail Splitters from the day they step in? That's not only important in that connectivity um, and belonging that we want our students to have, but it's also really important in making sure our students stay enrolled in Dublin Public Schools. And then we are also recruiting and coordinating all of our volunteer efforts in the district which we know is so important in building that community, especially, and I'm sure you guys are all feeling it, with being short staffed. How are we utilizing our volunteers to really fill some of those voids and doing that very intentionally and making sure our volunteers are fantastic for our students, but also having a positive experience. And our last one, our last pillar, the fourth pillar that we focus on is collaborative leadership. So we believe that there has to be shared ownership and shared accountability for the functioning of our school building. So within that, we are doing asset maps within every school community, what exists and how can we intentionally bring it into our school building. And then we are creating school advisory councils to ensure that every student and family has the ability to have a voice in school-based decision-making. So those are the four pillars. It's how we have interpreted it and put them in action in Des Moines. Um, and I am more than happy to answer any questions you have. Allison, can you share some of the uh, additional full service school uh, resources that you have been providing um, maybe even before you applied for this grant, because I know you guys have been offering uh, medical uh, things for the, the students, um, you know, like getting the kids uh, extra eye exams. And I know you've all been doing a lot with uh, feeding uh, the kids as well. So can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah, so we opened a full service medical and dental clinic. We actually have two um, in our district. We have one. It used to be at Scavo, but when we um, did some restructuring our with our Scavo program that was at Central, 
that clinic moved to the building I'm in, which is the Kurtz Opportunity Center. It's also our welcome center. So that is a partnership through Dental Connections and Primary Health Care, and that was funded by Delta Dental. So it's a full service. Like you could come to our building and get a root canal. Um, so what we really believe is that we want to take away as many barriers as possible. So um, families, especially, we have found our uh, multilingual students when they come to register with us, if we find that they have um, issues with immunizations or have challenges with getting into a, their doctor, we wanna do everything we can to get them what they need so that they don't have any delay in starting school. We also have a health clinic at Hoover Meredith, which is our middle and high school on the Northwest side of Des Moines. And then Vision to Learn is another partner that we're really proud of. And that is a program that is funded through the United Way, and then they do their own philanthropy. But what um, they do for us is they do eye exams for all of our kids, and then our kids that need glasses get two pairs of glasses. Um, that is primarily right now in elementary, and we do some in middle. We did a pilot this last year at North High School in our ELL with our ELL students, and we found that that is a huge need as well. Um, that it's um, like the state mandates certain screeners at certain points of time with age, but then once kids get old, old, older, um, they are no longer um, going to the eye doctor and a lot of our high school kids need glasses. So we are actively looking at how we can expand our high schools as well. So that would all fit for us under that integrated student support pillar. Allison, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and this one is twofold. What was the greatest challenge in adopting this full service schools model? And what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were planning uh, the implementation phases of this? Those are great questions. So um, I think one of the biggest challenges was just onboarding 28 people at one time. Um, and uh, knowing, I think the beauty and the challenge of community schools is every community school looks a little bit different. So although the four pillars, we strive to have those four pillars exist in every building, we know that from an implementation science that it looks a little bit different in every building. And that's really hard out of the gate to train 28 people and 51 people to say like, do this, but, also listen to your community and make sure that you are engaging your you know, building admin team. So I think in hindsight, um, maybe a little bit more work on the front end with building leaders um, to make sure that um, they were all in, fully engaged um, out of the gate. Um, and then just sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. And, um, you know, we, we believe in this model and it is so important to our community, but um, everyone went in like wanting to change the world in a day. And sometimes that's hard to accomplish. So we're, we're right sizing and, you know, continuing every day to get better, but it's a big lift. I don't see the chat. Did I get those questions, Heidi? Yeah, I think so. And Don, if she didn't hit your your questions how you wanted, please let yeah. me know. Yeah, please let me know. Um, I'm just sharing. That's easier. Oh, thanks. Allison, can you talk about uh, the integration with early childhood that could be allowable with this grant? Yeah, so... Um, we do not have a community school coordinator in our early childhood programs. They have what they call, um, I'm going to not remember the name, family, family engagement facilitators. They're wonderful. Um, they are funded through a different funding source in our district, but it is not the community school coordinator. So for us, um, this grant, um, because there is a supplant clause, 
is harder for us because we already have a community school coordinator in every building. We have some buildings that do not have a full time, but we also don't have anyone in early childhood. So that's one angle that we have looked at as a district in building capacity. Um, like I said, the transitional years are tough. So, you know, would this model be important in early childhood? I, I would say yes, um, but it just depends on where you're at um, in your school and what you currently have that exists. Allison, this is Dawn again, St. Mark in Dubuque. Thank you, you did answer my questions. Um, oh, and there's other questions too, so. I can wait for mine. Um, you can answer the ones in the chat, but mine is, um, what does a day in the life of a full-time coordinator look like? And are they housed like on the grounds of the school or like, what does, what does that look like? That's a great question. So yes, um, they are integrated within that school building. So they are all housed in the school. They are all Des Moines Public School employees. Um, and a day in the life. Um, I, when we interview, a lot of people always ask that question and I always turn it over to our coordinators who sit on our interview teams, but every day is a little different. And um, you know, what we have said is be present. How are you helping? Are you jumping in to help in the lunchroom? Um, that's how you build relationships. Um, so for the most part, what they are really looking at is those student support tickets that we use. We ask them to kind of start every day looking at the tickets that came in. So are there students that you need to follow up with right away? Um, are there things that like need your immediate attention? So most of the time that's how they're starting their day, but then they're looking at, um, you know, what am I planning for after school that day? How am I help supporting the teachers? What kiddos do I need to check in on? Um, Every day looks a little bit different. And I think that's part of why people love the job is because there's never a dull, there's never a boring day um, because there's a lot of things that need to get accomplished for our kids and our families every day. I'm reading the questions. The integration with early childhood, I do believe it is allowable. Um, so we are a recipient of the Federal Community Schools Grant. I think we got it five years ago. Well, it's a five-year grant. I think we're on year four. Um, and what we really wrote into the grant was create Um, get as much access as we can in early childhood. So really having our elementary community school coordinators partner with our early childhood to, you know, is it door knocking in certain neighborhoods that we know do not have access to early childhood. And then we really focused on access to our central campus because our data shows that um, we needed to ensure that every student had access to the programs that we offer at our central campus, which is kind of our, where we offer trades. We have a lot of great programs. So we are really focusing on ensuring access to Central through this grant. So it gave us four full-time community school coordinators through that grant application. Yes, so um, Vic, I'm answering your question. His qu question was, does the grant offer services during the school day? Yes. This is a school day model. So all of these programs are happening during the school day. So if our data at one building showed that um, we had a group of students that were really struggling with interpersonal relationships, I don't know. We have, a, we have sometimes have groups of students that can't seem to get along. So there may be a reality where the community school coordinator is reaching out to a partner in the community. I know we have brought in Young Women's Resource Center before to kind of do a group with those students, whether that's during lunch or recess, and that's all going to be based on our data. So I would say that it's not only it's encouraged, it's, it's really part of the model. It would be that integrated student support pillar. Allison, 
we learned something very valuable from your uh, talk about um, integration with early childhood, because with these grants, you don't have to do every single thing that they list in there. You just have to have a coordinated plan that's going to help your kids in your district or your community and, you know, make it all mesh together. So that's, I know this can be really overwhelming for somebody that's, you know, applying for the first time. And, uh, you know, with you guys, you are already taking those steps towards full service schools well before you applied for the grant. So I think that uh, your presentation really helped us uh, understand, you know, from the, um, uh, the district perspective a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, of course. And I would say too, I think what helped when we wrote the grant is it was very based on data. And um, that really is, we were able to pinpoint some areas in our system where we knew that this model would help us move towards um, more equitable outcomes for students. So I would really um, encourage you to look at your data where this model um, would have the biggest impact um, for your students and families. And I am, Heidi knows how to track me down. I'm happy to put my contact information in the chat too and feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help in any way I can. Hi, Allison, Dawn again. I tend to have lots of questions. Um, I have two more. The first one's pretty simple. Do you have at your full service community schools, do you also have 21st century funding or um, not? Yes, at 15 of them. Okay, and so your full service community school grant is paying for what happens during the day and then 21st is paying for what happens in after school? Yep, so um, our community school coordinators are going to be coordinating that 21st century program, but what the 21st century dollars pay for is when we're um, bringing in the actual programs for our students. Okay, and then um, I feel terrible even asking this question, but we're always asked to be thinking about it. So if you guys have come up with some grand scheme, I'm curious of what it is. Um, do you, so you're in year four or five, what, what has the idea around being able to sustain this looked like? Yep, nope, great question. Um, so Title IV, Title IV-B is allowable um, for community schools, Title Title I actually in some communities around the country. Now, I don't know if in the state of Iowa we've used, used it, um, but the coalition actually does a phenomenal job of putting out different uh, research briefs on how to sustain community schools. So we have used a lot of that. The other thing that we have done um, to sustain community schools is um, the use of our enterprise funds. So we have our enterprise funds and our after school programs. So if our community school coordinators are coordinating the after school programs, even our fee based after school programs in some situations, we are funding them through our enterprise fund accounts. Did that answer your question? And I'm happy, I can probably track down some of the, um, there was a document they put out, it was probably about four years ago, that was language to use around um, how to use title for full service community schools. Yeah, it did answer my question. The only thing that I'm not familiar with is what enterprise funds are. So I don't know if that's like, we're a community-based organization. So I don't know if that's a school district language. It yep. It's a school. So it's our fee-based after-school programs. Thank you. Yep. The, and I don't know, United Way of Central Iowa is also a big supporter of community schools. That's nationally and locally as well. So we also get funding from United Way, um, but United Way worldwide um, is a huge supporter of the work of community schools and part of the coalition for community schools as well. A uh, question in the chat, can we use this grant for any out of school time? I would think so. So we wrote into our um, application for middle school, 
because what we found in digging into our data from middle school, now we have this grant at three of our middle schools and then central campus is that's where we fund our full service. So we wrote into the grant um, like a budget line item for out of school time programming, primarily for sixth graders, because what we found is in our system, um, we have you know, district funded activities in seventh and eighth grade, but we do not for our sixth graders. So we wrote in kind of a budget for each middle school to be able to provide opportunities for sixth graders after school. We also wrote um, a small amount of money into every school to be able to hire uh, parent liaisons which has been really great within that uh, collaborative leadership and practice pillar for us at those respective schools. I'm not sure if this question is for Vic or Allison, but um, well, one, I'd be curious, this is probably Department of Ed, but how can we find out if any schools in our community currently do have this grant? And then second, um, can community-based organizations apply for a full service community school grant? Like, can they be the ones who actually are the, I don't even know what word to use, but. Um, my, my understanding is yes. So um, Marshall Town, when we were a recipient, there was another district in our state. It wasn't a district, though. It was a community-based organization. I believe it was Marshall Town. Yeah. And I can't remember the name of the organization. I don't know if there's been any other recipients since then. Um, and then um, there are models around the country where school districts do partner with community-based organizations to provide the coordinator. Um, you would just have to make sure that the school um, is fully involved in that because they would have to sign off on that and they would have to be um, thought through together since that coordinator is full time in the school building during the day. Um, this is Barb. I have a question and it might be more for Vic. Um, I tuned in right at 10 o'clock. So um, two questions. One is the consortium amongst the state off the table or are you waiting to hear and two can a district of you know 1400 like mine um apply for this and have even a consideration or a chance okay um i uh was at the meeting specifically for states and they um, honestly, I think that they made a few mistakes. They don't want the states to be the lead, but then they forgot about the fact that if we do a bunch of applications, we put you all in our, our data system for payments, which helps for federal monitoring. <laughs> in fact, uh, United Way was complaining about that. They says, how are we supposed to manage all these different uh, you know, consortium fund streams. Um, so I have a meeting tomorrow where my higher ups are going to make a decision. We cannot be the lead applicant if we do a consortium application, which is really kind of crazy, you know, to do this as an SEA. They also want the SEA to do a guarantee on sustainability. Well, why would we do that if we're not the lead applicant? So, you know, we've got to get our finance people to, to our finance person to make some decisions. And uh, however, rest assured that I'm going to help you guys in your quest to apply for this. You know, uh, it's a really complimentary grant for 21st century. In fact, um, they were picking our brains 10 years ago about what are things missing from 21st century. And what we did was we basically gave them the list for full service schools, all these things that we needed to provide for the, you know, the whole child. 
I think eventually the plan is to merge them together. But it takes time, you know, the feds don't move very fast. I am still waiting on the update for the 2003 guidance, which they say will be out next year after 20 years they've been working on it. <laughs> um, and yes, you it, th this grant applies to um, school districts of all sizes, okay? And uh, you know, even if we don't apply as a state, I'm gonna be available to help you with questions and maybe help you find the right resources. So um, I, I do want to encourage you to think about your application. And right now at this point, you would be gathering that data uh, about your district, about your thinking about how you would do it, uh, irregardless of how you're going to apply. Is this grant available every year? Oh, sorry, Barb, go ahead. Shai was just gonna say thank you. Um, is this grant available every year and is it always due at the same time? Because I think the time frame was like September that it was gonna be due this year. Well, I'm not sure about the time frame. but on the website, they list the years that they funded it and it's it's considered a discretionary grant. So I don't think that they're obligated to do one every year, uh, but they have been consistent in this. Um, the time frame, uh, you know, they gave us a notice a little bit earlier, but at the time I was not encouraged to apply for anything, but we've got some new uh, leadership that's very supportive of after school and then, um, I had mentioned this and they told me to do everything I can to help support you guys. So that's what I'm doing. Um, Don, I can uh, resend as well the link to um, the, the RFA for this grant. It would be a, a fairly tight turnaround. Um, I think applications are due September 12th. So here's something else to consider. Um, I realize it's a really tight turnaround, but what is to prevent us from saying, okay, let's have a, uh, uh, a group that wants to prepare a year in advance for this grant, and we meet and discuss things and try to, you know, build those partnerships and get everything ready. I mean, we've got a wealth of resources. Um, if some of you don't think you can turn things around in the short time period, um, you know, we use this as an opportunity to have, uh, you know, something for next year. Yeah, I really like that. And I think when you think about what Allison said, you know, if I knew then what I know now, it was really establishing those partnerships and those relationships and um, some of the upfront work that, I think is really important to laying a solid foundation. And so I, I mean, Caitlin and I will talk, but I really think this would be a future year opportunity that we would be interested in um, since it's not gonna be the statewide and it's, you know, there's, there's not the sense of urgency of making it happen by September, but rather being able to, I mean, something we say around here a lot and Allison said it is sometimes you gotta slow down to go fast and, that gets tricky as a nonprofit when money's right in front of your face that you know that you need and in alliance with what you're doing, but yet um, getting in over our heads sometimes puts us further behind. Uh, DMEA, or it's the NEA, um, also has adopted a version of this model uh, nationally. Um, and they have a really very, a very in-depth needs assessment that they encourage um, community-based organizations or schools to do before implementation of a coordinator. So I can send that to Heidi to send out as well.
And if any of you are going to, you know, try to do that short time frame, and you've got a few uh, questions and things you want to set up a meeting with me, I'm happy to provide um, any um, information that I can. Um, so I will let you guys know via email what uh, what I'm told to do on this. I mean, we. Do we um, I don't know if they'll approve us being a partner in a statewide, but then somebody else would have to be the lead. So I have to wait for guidance on that. All right, well, thank you, Allison, so much for taking the time with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Yes. I, did I did record this, so I'll make sure everybody has a link in case there's other people in your organization that want to take a look and educate themselves as well. Uh, and I'll send a summary with the links that we talked about in it too. So uh, if there's no more questions, uh, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Yeah, super helpful, thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye.